What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before him, heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God we serve. What a holy God we serve. What a holy God we serve. Angels bow before him, heaven and earth adore him. What a holy God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before him, heaven and earth adore of our purpose, Lord God, even if it hasn't been revealed to us, Lord God. Hallelujah. Because we come for you with purpose to pray and cease without ceasing. Lord God, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We ask that you continue to bless those that are on the way here. Bless us who are sitting in our seats, Lord God. Lord God, we just ask that you come into this service, Lord God. 
you are welcome here. You can rest here, Lord God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Lord God, hallelujah. We thank you. We thank you, Lord Jesus. You are so amazing, and we give you all the glory and all the praise. We ask that you be within the praise team, be with the usher board, be with every auxiliary, Lord God, and bless the speaker, Lord God. Give us a word, Lord God, and let us open our ears and hear, Lord Jesus, what the speaker has to say, Lord Jesus. Lord, we thank you again in advance for all the many blessings you are going to have bestowed upon us, Lord God. We thank you for the favor, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I don't know what favor isn't fair, but I know with the faith of God and grace of God, that's how it comes upon me, Lord Jesus. So I thank you for it, Lord Jesus. Your grace and your mercy. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
that you can let the praise on the inside just bubble up and you can join in a relationship, a communion with the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm going to turn the service into the hand of our first lady. And I just ask that you continue to keep me in prayer and that you continue to keep a praise on your lip. Amen. Amen. that God has entrusted his children with you. And it is our job to be the example to our children, to bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. So I thank and I praise God that you decided to worship with us this morning in this little old building on this side of Tampa we call Loops in the name of Jesus. God is great, greatly to his praise. I will not I counted robbery to come into his house and not give him my all. When I hit that clock at 7.30 at the VA hospital, I give him my all, hallelujah. I will not give God any less than that in the name of Jesus. So I praise him on this morning. I thank and I praise God for our, our devotional leaders on this morning, Sister Mary and Sister Dora for ushering us into the presence of the Lord. I thank and I praise God for Sister Ashley, you know, for doing what she always does. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, just ushering us right on in. And I just thank God that you are here on this morning. And we have a special treat for you on this morning. I thank and I praise God because every Mother's Day is usually me or, you know, me up here. And I know y'all get tired of hearing me all the time. And Sister Mickey's getting a little old. Y'all need, um, need a younger voice in the name of Jesus. But I think and I praise God, I reached out to this young lady. I watched her grow up, grow up in the church. She's an awesome woman of God, beautiful woman of God. But I'm not going to do the introduction. She is going, um, we're going to allow her daughter to do the introduction on this morning. Amen. Amen. I said again, train them up in the way that they should go. Because we're not going to be here always. We are the baton. Yeah. Hallelujah. And we're passing the baton and the torch because the torch has the fire in the name of Jesus. So we want to pass on the fire too. So I'm going to ask you as um, Sister Kennedy forehand to come and to take, take that mic right there and to introduce the speaker on this morning. And if my sound team will give me a second mic for our speaker. In the name of Jesus. And the next voice that after Sister Kennedy um, introduces her, the next voice will be that of Lady Devon Forehand. Y'all pray for her in Jesus' name. Amen.
Some days she doesn't want to deal with it, but she manages to get through it. She sacrificed a lot for me. Praise the Lord, saints. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, saints. Hallelujah. The presence of the Lord, surely the presence of the Lord is in this place this morning, giving honor to the angel of this church, Papa Mickens, <laughs> and our first lady, Mama Mickens. Let's give them a hand praise. I am so grateful for the invitation to be here. I thank and praise God for my sister leading us into worship. I'm so sorry I came up here looking a mess. I tried to get myself together, but when you pour out, when the worship is genuine, you cannot help but to join in. Amen. 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 I'm going to hopefully not be before you too long today. I'm going to ask that you stand while we read the... Um, base text after that you are you know if you're inclined to you may we're going to read from first kings 19 verse 19 through 21 i'll give you just a few moments to get it if you have your phone get it on that if you've got it on your bible that's fine and they got it up there amen so he departed from there and found elisha the son of shaphat who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen in front of him and he was with the twelve. Elisha, Elijah passed by him and cast his cloak upon him. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Let me kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. And he said to him, Go back again, for what have I done to you? And he returned from following him and took the yoke of oxen and sacrificed them and boiled their flesh with the yokes of the oxen and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he arose and went after Elijah, and he assisted him. Amen. I'm going to ask Pastor Mickens to come lead us in prayer before I go before the Lord. Amen. Y'all give him a hand as he comes. Praise the Lord, everybody. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, everybody. Come on and clap your hands and give God a praise. Hallelujah. It's an honor to be here on Mother's Day to stand before such wonderful women of God and to look on your lovely faces and know that it's the Lord that's keeping you and that he's watching over you right now. Thank God for our speaker this morning. That's the Lord that's going to share with us touch our lives on today as we bow heads lord god our savior and our deliverer we thank you for your bountiful blessings your tender mercy and your grace thank you because we know that you're right now god that never fails you always come through lord god every time thank you for being lord god the god of the universe you have made all things by your power divine and for your glory as we come together as a family in christ on this morning open up our ears and our hearts that will be receptive unto your word. Let your word come forth with, Lord God, hallelujah, a, a power, Lord God, and a way to touch every life. Let the saints be strengthened. Let them be encouraged in the name of Jesus Christ. Let them grab hold of the truth and be blessed. Oh God, and we'll ever praise you and give you the glory for the working of your power. There's nobody like you, oh God, in the heavens or the earth. And so we magnify your name. We exalt your name together and we give your name the praise. And everybody in the house, clap your hands and tell you, hallelujah. hallelujah. Yes, leave some of that oil on this microphone. 
All right, you may have your seat. I honor my husband today. If you could stand up. Y'all look at my boo. Stand up, Cedric. <laughs> I honor my husband today, my children, my mother, the best mother in the world, fight me. I honor my mother for being here with me today. And I honor all the mothers of the house. I know how difficult it is to balance work life. And even if you are a stay-at-home mom, which is the hardest calling, <laughs> I am praying for you and I just honor you today. So our subject today is, are you the one who has been called? Are you the one who has been called? And Lord, I ask, decrease me, you increase, speak through me, make me your vessel in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Are you the one who has been called? When we think about, before I even get into any of the, any more of the text, I want to say when we think about are you the one who has been called, we automatically think about some grand calling. You know, we are the one who's called. I've been called to preach. I've been called to prophesy. I've been called to heal. Um, but you may be the one who has been called to empty out the trash cans. You may be the one who has been called to turn the beds over. You may be the one who has been called to be a caregiver. And no calling is greater than the one that God gives you, not man. So I want to talk about that today. Are you the one who has been called? And are you the one who has accepted their calling? All right. I want to talk about Elisha, but before I talk about Elisha, I have to talk about Elijah to give you context, okay? Um, Elisha was Elijah's predecessor, okay? He was the one who, or ver vice versa rather, okay? So he was the one who came after Elijah. And I want to talk to you about when it's time to pass the mantle. If I had a third subject, it would be when to pass the mantle, when to accept the mantle. Elisha's enemy was Queen Jezebel. Who here knows about Jezebel? Yeah. All right. We always say that woman has a Jezebel spirit on her when someone is boisterous or controlling, but it was much, much, much more than that. Um, Jezebel had a hate for God and his prophets and his word. Jezebel was a murderer and a whore. And so when we say Jezebel, we don't take that lightly because such a negative connotation is associated with the name of Jezebel. Amen. Amen. So we know that there was a charge put out to kill God's prophets. Okay. Obadiah hid 100 prophets and he hid them in caves 50 by 50. So two separate caves we know they were in. He was giving them provision bread and water to sustain them, okay? So when we think about a calling, again, we're talking about Elijah and Elisha, but what about Obadiah? The Lord called him to feed the prophets. Yeah. The Bible doesn't say Obadiah was called to be a prophet, that he was called to heal, that he was uh, called to plant churches. The Bible says his job was to give the prophets that were being hidden provision, bread and water, Think about if Obadiah thought so little of his calling, okay, and those prophets would have had no provision. Yeah. Because of his obedience, those prophets were sustained even when the Lord had put them in their hiding place. So again, it's just like a domino effect. That small thing, which the Bible says, despise not what? Small beginnings. Yeah. That small thing that you think is so insignificant and that you think, why am I not being elevated in the church? Why is my, my name not being called more than it is? You are sustaining the greater vision that God has given. So without getting too much into that, I'm going to leave from there. Your calling is imperative, no matter how small you, you believe it to be in the grand scheme of things, you matter. You are important. The vision, for all intents and purposes, needs you. Amen? 
All right. Verse 18 and 17, it does say that Elijah told him, go tell Ahab where I am. Tell him, come find me. Come see about me. And he pretty much said to him, are you crazy? He has sent me here. He has sent me there. Everywhere he's, that I've gone looking for you, he has made them sign an affidavit and said they are not hiding you. And you want to send me to him to tell him where you are. Surely you will leave this place and I'll be killed. And he assured him. He said, I give you my assurance. I will wait here. Go tell him. Come see about me. <laughs> That, that tickled me because I think about so many times, even when we're on assignment, there may be someone in your way. And even though God has given you direction and vision because of the naysayers, we become afraid. And again, we shrink back from our calling because we say, well, I know sister so-and-so is going to get in my way or, you know, brother so-and-so is going to get in my way and I don't want that problem. So I'm going to go to this church. Or I'm going to sit back for a few weeks and until that project is done or until we move on to the next thing, and then I'll come back. He said, tell him where I am. Tell him, come see me. Now, Elijah was a man of fear, and I'm going to show you that he was a man of fear. This is right here in the word of God. Yeah. He was a man of fear, and in that moment, such holy boldness, because if anybody knows anything about Ahab, Ahab was a yes man. Anything his wife said... They say happy wife, happy what? Life. He must have a happy life because whatever Jezebel wanted, Ahab was the man to see it through. So if we know for a fact how much Jezebel hated, hated Elijah, he knew that if Ahab got word that he would surely kill him, and he said, come see me. All right? He said, is it you, old troubler of Israel? Why have you come to trouble me? And he pretty much told him, it's not me that is causing the trouble, it's you. You've been following Baal. You've been worshiping Baal. And you need to be following God. You have put away, you've put out all these Asher proles, you've done all these things against God. Even in that moment, because Ahab did come to see him, and I know he was afraid, because I'm going to move on to the next text to show you where he was afraid. He still stood his ground and did and said what thus saith the Lord. Again, when you think your vision is small and when you think your project is small, God will give you boldness to magnify, what does it say, to magnify your office. No matter what you're doing, it needs to be big. You need to be bold. And I know this is Mother's Day, but this is to the brothers. This is to the little ones. Whatever God tells you to do, make it big. Make God proud. Do everything unto God. Amen. All right, so we move on from there. And Elijah began to prophesy to Ahab, and he told him, listen, all of you are going to die, pretty much is what he told him. You're all going to die. Whoever eats at Jezebel's table, this is the death they're going to come to, thus saith the Lord. And so pretty much Ahab said, well, I'm going to call your bluff, because for a man who has been hiding and running, you're talking a big, big game. Hallelujah. As the Lord liveth, he said, meet me at Mount Carmel. Who's ever been in a fight in school before? Don't raise your hand if you have. Oh, she knows. So I can remember we would be in school and they would say, meet me by the lunchroom at 2.15. And it'd be 11 o'clock. You'd be like, what time is it? Oh, my God. And you would be counting down. And as I was reading the text, I could just see not Ahab counting down, but Elijah counting down because he ran and he hid for so long. And all the while, remember, we haven't even gotten to Elisha yet. This is just to give you context on the man of whose mantle he was to take. Amen. So he said, meet me at Mount Carmel and we're going to settle the score. Bring two bulls. We're going to set up an altar. If Baal be Baal, and he's God, we're going to serve him and let him show himself strong. But if God be God, we're going to give him the praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And when they got to Mount Carmel, just to illustrate it for you, he said he took 12 stones for the 12 sons of Jacob. Again, lineage is important even in your calling. The things you do will affect your children and your children's children and your children's children. So when you're disobedient to your calling, it will get done either by you 
for the next generation or the next generation, and I'm going to show you that in text as well. And a lot of hardship that we go through is avoiding our what? Our calling. And a lot of times we don't even realize we're avoiding our calling. Sometimes we say it's fear, or sometimes we say it's anxiety, and we do so many things to avoid having to really catch the vision and carry the vision. It's going to get done one way or another because God's word cannot fall to the ground. So if he said it, it has to accomplish itself. And I'm going to show you that in text. Hallelujah. Well, he took the 12 stones for the 12 sons of Jacob. He put wood in the middle of the altar. He cut the bowl into pieces. Remember, they bought two bowls. He said, fill four jars of water. He poured them on the altar. He poured it on the bowl. He did this three times. Three times he did this. So by now we know that this bull is drenched. It's drenched because they just killed these bulls. This is not, you're thinking about meat you get from Publix where pretty much all the blood is gone. This was freshly slaughtered. So the altar should have been, you know, covered, easy to ignite. But by the time he did this, everything was gone. It was just water soaking wet. So anybody who grills knows the worst thing that happens when you have wet coals or wet wood because it's gonna be harder for the spark to ignite. So he's showing you, I'm gonna show you, this is not going to be an easy task. And a lot of times when God gives us a task, it is not an easy task, but he said, if you just believe, hallelujah. So he poured the water on the altar three times. The Bible says the water filled the trench that he made about the altar. So it was so much water that at this point, it's sitting water. It's sitting water, okay? It's like a puddle is the best way I could describe it, a deep puddle. But it says a trench, so we know this was a lot of water. The Bible says Elijah prayed, and he said, Calm down, Lord, if you be God, and I want you to set this on fire. And the Bible says after he prayed, now mind you, I have to go back because when the servants of Baal when they prepare their altar, it says they pray, they weep, they cry, they gnash their teeth. In fact, they were so distraught that the Bible says, Lord, help me to give this thing the way you, the way you told me to give it to me. Hallelujah. He, they were so distraught that they begin to cut themselves. They begin to cut themselves. So that stood out to me because we talk about self-harm. Does anybody know what self-harm is? Yes. All right, so we act like we don't in church, um, but a lot of our children engage in self-harm or their friends or oh, self-harm is a thing. Um, they begin to cut themselves, the Bible says, as it was their custom. So we know that shedding of blood is for the remission of sins. And any other bloodshed is not of God. And so these people knew that their God was so dead that they had to offer life to him. How many of you know that the life is in the blood? So they shed their blood. Look, Bell, you know, trying to get his attention. But we serve the only living God. We serve the only breathing God, the only moving God. We don't have to cut ourselves to get God's attention. Hallelujah. And the Bible says that they cut themselves as it was their custom. They became so frustrated, nothing happened. So Elijah began to get holy boldness. He got so bold that he said, is Baal relieving himself? And if you look at specific trans, uh, translations, it says, is Baal in the restroom? He started talking trash because he realized, okay, 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 I might have this in the bag, nothing's happening. And he said, where is he? Has he turned his back to you? Is he not here? And so at that point, I think he said to himself, okay, I got this. And that's where his faith began to grow and he began to magnify God and he began to see that God is alive. If I talk to him, I will see something. The Bible says that after he prayed, the altar, consumed, it was consumed with fire. The Bible says even the rocks were consumed with fire. It says the dust was consumed by the fire. The Bible says that the water in the trench dried up by the fire, so there was no dust, there were no rocks, there was no wood, there was no bull. He said that it was all consumed by the fire, and the fire was the signifier of the what? The holy? 
the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost fire, when we sing those songs and say consuming fire, if we really knew what we were saying, I believe that we'd have such passion when we go before the Lord in worship. Because when we think about consuming fire, when they would lay things on the altar, when the fire of the Holy Ghost came, it's not like when we burn and we have to empty out our grill and we have to dump out the coals and we have to, the fire of the Lord removes, it oblivious everything that is there. There is nothing left. For something to be consumed is to be eradicated, to be completely removed so there is no trace of. Hallelujah. Yeah. All right. The Holy Ghost fire consumed, consumed everything that was on the altar. The Bible says at that time, once the sacrifice was consumed, the people were afraid. They became afraid. They fell on their faces and they said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. After he began to proclaim that the Lord was God, you would think they would all worship and they would change their ways, but they had tarried so long in the way of sin. The Bible says that Elisha took the prophets and he murdered them all. He took them and he murdered them all because it was time to pay penance. It was time to play, pay the piper. When our faith comes into play, the very same people that you run from and the very same people that strike fear into your heart will be the ones that are consumed by Holy Ghost fire. They will be the ones that set the pace for what's going on for you. They're going to pave the way. Hallelujah. But it's our faith. And the Bible says, be it, be it thou according to your faith. If you would only just believe. Now, even though Elijah just witnessed these events firsthand, not even firsthand, he was a participant. And he called down fire. He worshiped. He praised the Lord, strengthened him to be able to go ahead and er eradicate the, the whole town of these false prophets of Baal. He was still afraid. The Bible says that he was petrified at the words and thoughts of Jezebel. Even when we know God, we still don't truly believe ourselves and we can see our, our co-workers at work and witness to them and we can quote scriptures to our children and to our family members, but in our hearts, we don't actually believe like we say we do. And it shows when we go through because we can say the words, but we don't live the words. Now he just watched the Lord do exactly what he said he would do and he was still afraid of Jezebel. Hallelujah. In Mark 9, 23 and 25, we see where the man prayed, Lord, bless my unbelief, because he said, Jesus, my son, my son, my son, your disciples could not cast these spirits out. What's going on? You know, he's throwing himself in the fire. Jesus said, it's because your faith is so small. And as I read this, I kept saying, Lord, why do you keep having me cross-reference between these different things? Because the Lord said to me so clearly, your calling is just as much dependent on your faith and on your obedience as you really believing that it is me. Because if you don't have the faith and you don't believe that what I'm telling you to do really comes from me, you won't, you won't be able to push the vision through. You won't be able to see it through because you're still questioning, is it me or is it God? You're vacillating back and forth because you don't believe that God is who he says he is. Even though Elisha saw the prophets, he himself killed them. He still was afraid of one woman. And so on Mother's Day, we think about the power of one woman. Yes. And with Jezebel, it was in a negative connotation. And we think about how she raised so much hell. When I say that, my children say, can you really raise hell? Absolutely. Yes. She raised so much hell, literally and figuratively, in that town that the people shook when they heard her name. Yes. All right? So... She gave a threat and she said to Elijah, because at this time Ahab went home. For whatever reason, I do know why, because the Bible says that Ahab, when he had the chance later on to repent, he did. He repented and he prayed and he asked God to forgive him. He never left Jezebel now. Sometimes we repent, but we don't come out of sin. And so you will still pay, which he does later on. But he repented and... The Bible says, he said, look at him. Look how even he has turned his heart from sin. So I will not punish him in this generation, but in the next. 
So or remember earlier when I said your calling is your calling and you will see it through in this life or the next. And when I say the next, I don't mean an after like I'm talking about your generations. Yes. Just like the Bible says the promise is unto you yes. and your children's children and your children, it's generational. It's just like Jesus came from 42 generations. It's generations. It's over generation, over generation. And when we don't do it, it has to be fulfilled at some point in time. Amen. And so after everything happened, Ahab went home and I could just imagine him saying to his wife, honey, let me tell you what happened today. And I could just see him stutter. Yeah, he's a bad boy. Let me tell you what happened. The Bible says that Jezebel sent word and she said to him, by this time tomorrow, one of us is going to be dead. One of us will be dead. And that isn't even what happened, but we are snared by the words of our what? Our mouths. And so even though she did not die the next day, neither did he. The Bible says he actually ran. He went and he hid. So again, remember I said Elijah was a man of what? He was a man of fear and faith. I see everybody say faith over fear, faith over fear. But a lot of times we're like Elijah. We need to say fear over faith because even though we've seen the goodness of the Lord, we've tasted the goodness of the Lord, his sustaining hand, his keeping hand, his providing hand, we still get in a situation and we get spiritual amnesia. We can't remember how he kept us. We can't remember how he healed us. We can't remember how he sustained us. We can't remember how he brought us to where we are now. And we start to shake in our boots and we say, well, Lord, what am I going to do? And instead of calling on Jesus, we call our friend. Girl, I don't know what I'm about to do. He lost his job again. We call our sisters. I don't even know. I'm, I'm about to go. I just can't handle this anymore. Even though God has shown time and time again that he will regulate our minds. He said, if you keep your mind on him, he'll keep you in what? Talk back to me. He'll keep you in what? Perfect peace. If your mind is stayed on him, because if we had perfect peace, we would be able to believe and hold fast to his words, and our faith truly would supersede our fear. Amen? Yeah. Amen. So he went home and he told her, and she said, you know, one of us gonna die. He's got to go. But he ran, he hid, and the Bible says that, and that was in Proverbs 6 and 2, by the way, how we are snared by the words of our mouth. We are taken by the words of our mouth. In 1 Kings, the 19th chapter, the Bible says he became so afraid, he became suicidal. This is biblical now. This is not 13 reasons why. This is not uh, anything on TV where we need to, this is in the Bible. The Bible says he prayed, death, come to me. He prayed, Lord, just take me now. Even though he just saw that the prophets eradicated by him. He just saw, he knew Ahab was out to get him. The Lord didn't let any harm come to him. He just saw the Holy Ghost fire consume all that was on the altar and he still in his heart allowed fear to motivate him. The Bible says he left his servant in one place and said, you stay here. And he hid. He went and he hid. Amen. Amen. So the angel of the Lord said to him, why are you so afraid? Why are you afraid? Uh, he met him. The Bible says he fed him. So the angel supped with him. He fed him. And the Bible says that the food that the angel gave him sustained him 40 days and 40 nights. And so when we talk about, talk about types of Christ, we can really, really go there and look at all the correlations and all of that. But we're not there today, but I want to point that out to you. The Bible says that 40 days and 40 nights he was sustained. Jezebel never got her hands on him. Remember, she said, by this time tomorrow you'll be dead. So again, the Lord showed him, it's my word over the word of the enemy. Surely I'll sustain you. And I remember when we used to go on true Daniel's fast, where we didn't have Morningstar, and we didn't have all these vegan and soy. And when we had fast, it was water. I wish I hear how I say water. <laughs> we had fresh fruit. We had salad. I mean, my grandfather was so strict. He used to say, get all that salad dressing off of there. He, he wanted us to eat like rabbits. But it, it really was a thing of sacrifice. He wanted us to learn, you know, eat mashed potatoes and gravy. You might as well go ahead and eat. 
E is you beat your body into subjection, beat it into subjection. So you think about one meal to sustain you for 40 days and 40 nights, and the Lord still showed him, I am with you. He was still afraid. In the 23rd verse, he says, the dog shall eat Jezebel within the walls of Jezreel. Anyone who belongs to the house of Ahab, if they die in the city, the dogs will eat them. If they die in the field, the birds will eat them. Now, Jezebel did not serve God, but he, in the blessing plan, we read the Deuteronomy uh, 28 chapter, what does it say? Blessed shall we be in the what? Come on, y'all. Blessed shall we be in the city. Blessed shall we be. So she was cursed. The Bible says, if the prophets of oh, Ahab and Baal die in the city, the dogs will eat them. If they die in the field, the birds will eat them. The same place that God takes you to bless you, your enemies will be cursed then. If you could just hold on to the promises of God. And I mean, truly believe. I mean, if you have faith in God, like you had faith in your high heels, when you put them on, you walk and you for whatever reason just trust that they won't break. And some of us know them heels be skinny and they don't hold us, they shouldn't, but you have faith in them. Every time you sit in the chair, you have faith that those four legs will what? Hold you, and some of us know we got some strong faith. Every single time you get in the car and you turn the ignition and the wheels go, you have faith that those tires won't what? They won't pop on you. You have faith that that engine won't explode. When you put your seatbelt on, you have faith that if you are in an accident, it will save your what? Life. If we trusted in God, right. the way we do man's creation, yeah. our fear would diminish so much so to the point where God would really be able to be magnified in our life. I was praying one time and God kept saying, make me bigger. And I was just looking around and saying, what is that? He kept saying, make me bigger, see me bigger, make me bigger. And I was reading in Revelations and he said, the last angel to open up the last scroll has had one foot on land, one foot in the ocean, a rainbow round about him, hasha de robosi, and clothed in the clouds. And I said to myself, that's impossible. How large must he be and a lot of times we worship the creation more than the creator and that the angel has one foot in the land and one foot in the ocean magnify god make him bigger make him greater and i begin to think how big is god to consume the altar to consume the rocks to consume the water to consume the bull to leave nothing and so when god speaks his very breath begins to write. Hallelujah. That's not even what this is about. I won't go there, but if we would cling to every word that he says, we would make him so big. Our faith would expand so wide. We would be able to manifest the words of God in our life. We would be able to manifest the promises of God in our life. He said, you will not be the, the tail, but always the head. You'll be above only and never beneath. If you would hearken unto the voice of the Lord your God. See, because we get excited, but we leave out the part of your hearken unto the voice of the Lord our God. Elisha kept doing what God told him to do, but he was so motivated by fear, just like Moses. Lord, I stutter. Can't you send somebody else? Lord, I stutter. He said, well, take your brother with you. Oh, gosh, you know, is there no one else? So God can still bless you when you fight his vision, but your way is so much harder. Elijah was taken up in a chariot and he never got to see the destruction of Jezebel. Elisha, however, was able to carry on the mantle and see the work done. Moses never got to go to the promised land. Do you all see where I'm getting going with this? It's generational because when we are disobedient and we hesitate and we vacillate, you may never see the blessings of God, but God's no liar. So just because you don't get it, it may be your great, great grandson. It may be your great, 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 great grandson. My husband and I were sitting on the sofa the other day and the Holy Spirit was just working. And I don't even know what we were watching, but I said, Lord, I pray for my great, great granddaughter. 
Fill her with the Holy Ghost in the name of Jesus. Keep her from sin in the name of Jesus. And I said, my great, great, great grandson, let him be a man of God. Because I realize we're still worried about today when God has already moved on four generations from now. And so I don't worry about today anymore. I no longer pray about how am I going to put my kids through college. How I'm worried about lineage. I say, well, my children, my great, great grandchildren, I want them, to, want them to say she's a woman of God. Our family serves God because my great, great grandmother, she lived under God's promises. She followed, she walked in her calling, amen? So again, Elisha, at this point, I'm gonna move on because I have stayed on him long enough to give you context. The Bible says that he was walking in a field and at this point, Elijah, I think, is starting to realize, I need help. But I really don't think he realized because, pull up um, 19, verse 19, I'm sorry, chapter 19, 19 and 21 again. I want to read this to you again. Amen. So, the Bible says that, Elisha, while he was working, he saw Elisha. Remember, a man of fear and a man of faith. He was plowing, he's working in the field. So let me, let me stop there. A lot of times, again, when we're looking for elevation, we're waiting for elevation. We're not working for elevation, amen. When Elijah passed him, Elijah wasn't really looking for help and Elisha really wasn't looking for any type of elevation. He was working, he was already tending to what he was supposed to be doing. Imagine if Elijah said, I'm calling out of work today. The oxen can take care of themselves. His opportunity literally walked past him, okay? And had he not been in place, it would have went right over his head, right over his head. And so a lot of times we look at leadership and we say, this is stale, this is old, we do the same thing. We've been doing this the same way 20, 30 years. Somebody has to be there to catch the mantle. Somebody has to be there to carry the work. But if all you do is fuss and complain and say, this is not for me, let me go elsewhere. When it's time for the mental to be passed, guess what you do? You call out of work. That opportunity is gonna walk right past somebody else. So it says, when he was piling his 12 yoke of oxen in front of him, and he was with the 12, Elijah passed by him and he cast his cloak upon him, like his jacket, his ephod. And he left the oxen and ran after Elisha. So after his jacket fell, he pretty much ran after me. I'm coming with you. And he begged him, let me kiss my father and mother and I'll follow you. Let me tell my parents goodbye. The Holy Spirit was on him even then and said, follow him. That is the man to follow. And Elisha said, what about I done to you? Why are you bothering me? I don't want to be bothered. And a lot of times we know when it is time for us to move on to the next step and our calling to the next level. Sometimes it can be a situation where leadership will kind of, I don't know if you're ready. Can you handle this? I don't know if you're ready. And you have to kind of stay the course and just say, let me help you. Let me be the one to help you bear this burden, amen? Some of y'all, I guess, have never had to speak to leadership and had to entreat them for the betterment of anything, but let me tell you, if you stay in the will, you will, and there will come a time where you're going to have to wait on the Lord to finish the work, wait on the Lord to equip you, and more importantly, wait on the Lord to touch the heart of leadership to allow you to move on to the next level, amen? I know that's a hard word to hear sometimes, but it is the truth. Well, fast forward past that. The Bible says that clearly he accepted him as his um, apprentice and he went on. And the day that Elisha, Elijah was taken up, because he didn't die, the Bible says he was taken up in a fiery chariot. Um, so two prophets came to Elisha and they said to him, do you know that today is the day your master's gonna be taken from you? And Elisha said, yes, I know. And so he went to Elisha, don't leave me, I won't leave you. And another prophet came to him and he said, do you know that today is the day your master will leave you? Yes, I know, yes, I know, and he went to him again, please don't leave me. So at this point, he's saying, I won't leave you, but he knows 
these are prophets of God. This man is getting out of here. So he said to him, hey, listen, before you leave, leave me that anointing. So he said, um, I want a double portion. He said, what is it you want? What do you want? So all the time he's going to him and he's finally, what do you want? I want a double portion of the anointing that is on you. And so he says, that's a hard thing you've asked for. But if you see me when I am taken, it'll be done. So he followed him around all day. I could just imagine him on him, following him, following him, following him. And the Bible says that when he was taken up, that same cloak that touched him while he walked through the field, guess what was left when he was taken up? The cloak. And the Bible says that there was almost like a fiery, I don't even know how to describe it, but there was a wall between them where he couldn't just get to him when he was taken up. Um, I can't remember what the exact word, because I used several translations, but pretty much there was like a gulf there, a fiery gulf that he couldn't get to him. But somehow that cloak was not consumed by the fire and it was left. And there again, when the Holy Ghost moves, sometimes even that praise and worship we had, you wonder how sometimes people can sit and be entertained and how the fire didn't consume them and how the fire didn't get on them and touch them. And you really do wonder. And sometimes there's like a gulf there, but it's, it's a spiritual gulf where if you choose not to allow the anointing of God in on you, the Bible says that what? It's foolishness to them that are lost. And so you have to choose to be found. You have to choose to find your place in worship. And so this cloak was not consumed by the fiery gulf. It was left. The Bible says that he took the cloak and he put it on his shoulders. Now, prior to that, there was water, and I'm closing here, but there was water, and they couldn't cross over. And the Bible says that that same cloak Elijah took and he rolled it up, and he rolled it, and as he rolled it, he hit the water, and he commanded the water to separate so we can cross over. And so they crossed over. So I think a lot of times when the Holy Spirit comes on us and he anoints us to do something. We really do ask ourselves, am I really equipped? Am I really the one? Am I going to be good enough to do this? So when Elisha got the cloak after Elijah was taken up, the Bible says he took it and he rolled it up and he said, where's the same God that Elijah used to separate this water? And the Bible says when he hit it, the water did separate. Yeah. Hallelujah. I want to ask you today, are you the one? who has been called. And I talk so much about Elijah because a lot of times when we have a calling, if you're taking over something or you're doing something, we have to live in the shadow of our leadership a lot of times. But here's the thing, when it's your time, it's your time. And God will anoint you and appoint you in one man or woman's anointing doesn't take away from another because every good and perfect gift comes from who? God. So what I am anointed to do may not be what you are anointed to do, but if you would just catch hold of what God's vision is for your life, there won't be jealousy. There won't be animosity. There won't be any type of unholy competition where I'm going to outdo you and I'm going to outdo that because my vision is integral to yours and vice versa. And the anointing that God places on me, if you put your trust in God and you believe in him, he said, only believe. That same anointing will come on you and he will equip you and you will change lives and you'll be a world changer if it is his will and if you have the faith. Lastly, obedience to God is the first step in becoming the one and walking in your calling. When God says go, when God says speak, when God says don't speak, because that is just as important as when he does say speak. Because the Bible says a man who offends not with his mouth is what? A perfect man. There is no perfection. So we have to learn, hone our ears to be able to hear when God is saying. Because the Bible says a brother offended is harder one than a strong city. And so we, we can stop a lot of things if we would stop our mouths. If we could just listen when the, when the voice of God says, don't speak, be still, be still, we would be able to walk because learning not to speak is just as important as learning when to speak. The second thing in closing is obedience to those who have rule over you because 
Elisha was told what to do by the prophet. What if Elisha would have got bigoty and said, well, he about to go anyway. I'm about to say go for her. That's crazy. He, he, I don't want to do it the way he did it. I don't want to do it the way he did it. This is the way I want to do it. He would have never gotten the blessing because he was disobedient. That was not his lot. And the last thing and the most important thing in walking in your calling is faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. And so when God is giving us that vision and he shows you something and you don't understand it, have faith to just walk. Have faith just to go. Have faith like you believe those hills are going to hold you. Have faith like you believe that chair is going to hold you. Have faith that you believe that that check is going to deposit. Have faith that you believe that that baby is going to grow into a strong man. Have faith that you believe your marriage will last. Have faith that you believe your child will grow and understand and learn and come into the full knowledge of Christ. We need to have the same faith in God that we do in things. Because when God calls you to be the one, how can you become what you don't believe? How can you fulfill what you don't see? And so when the man prayed, bless my unbelief to see his child healed, just like that, just like that, just like that. When Elijah was gone, Elisha went on. He healed the Shulamite, Shunamite son, rather. He threw flour in the poisonous stew. They said, prophet, prophet, don't eat this. He threw flour, it was clean to eat. The Bible talks about he then went on and he healed Naaman of leprosy. Again, obedience to the man of God. He said, dip yourself seven times. And he said, why go to the Jordan? Isn't that where they wash and they wash? I don't want to go there. And even the servant had to tell his master, no, sir, do you not understand what he's telling you? You can be washed clean. So in closing, I want to say to you, when you are called to be the one, count it not robbery to listen to your leadership. Elijah was not a perfect man. He was a man who worked out of fear more than faith, despite what he saw, even though he firsthand witnessed the goodness of God. In his imperfection, Elisha looked at him and still acknowledged him as his leader. Through respect and through faith, he was able to move on and receive the promises of God. He could have criticized him as a leader and said, look at all the times he was afraid. He ran from a woman. He did this. But he chose to submit himself to those who had what? Rule over him. A lot of times that's hard to do when you feel like you have an imperfect leader. As women in our households, a lot of times, we don't always agree with things that our husband's saying. We may feel like, oh, I could do better. That's not your place. That's not your place. I could do this better. I could do this better. Submit yourself to him. He's accountable to God. And when you think about it like that, you will have compassion on those who have rule of. You'll have compassion on your pastor. You'll have compassion on your husband and your employer. Because when they are a ward over you, you pray, Lord, for my sake, spare them. You know, don't punish them for me. So I ask you all to keep me in your prayers. I hope that this bless you today. And remember, if you are the one who is called, walk in obedience, walk in faith. Thank you. Give God some praise. Give God some praise. I don't even think you knew the magnitude of that message right there. Are you the one who has been called? I don't even think she knows what's going on in this house right now. I, I'm standing here. I'm just, just going to do what? Be obedient. Do what God tells me to do. I hope you're with me, Mike. I hope you know where I'm going with this. My auntie and my uncle have said many things that she had preached about. This cannot carry based upon one man and one woman. Feel the weight of the Spirit of God right now. 
Jesus. This goes to everybody. I'm not just saying this is going just to the men right now. But God has called many of us to a higher calling. What does that really mean? That out of our comfort zone, he is trying to use you to present himself to the world. So how that chapter started, he, he called the man of God and said, I'm going to start here before I get there. The word of the Lord came to Elijah. That means God invoked the conversation to the man of God. So now they're in conversation. He has given him instructions on what he wants him to do. I'm not trying to preach. I'm just trying to, I'm trying to open your eyes. I'm, she already preached the message. I'm just trying to get you to understand what was missed that God had given us instruction because the plan is going to accomplish according to his word. Not according to your ability, according to his word because my word never falls or never fails. Not one dot, one tittle. The period in the word of God is the period. Not the word the, just the period. Somebody will get this. Just accept the calling and God's got it. That's it. I'm telling you, my brother. Just accept the calling, God's got it covered. Because it's according to his word.